Good morning, everyone. Um, just to introduce the session, so I'm Lisa Gray, the Program Manager for the JISC Assessment and Feedback Program. Um, this particular session, it's, it's one of a number that we're running as part of the program. Um, one of the themes that came through very clearly was that that feedback and, and the way that students engaged with it was a big theme for the program. And a number of projects have explored different ways of analysing the quality of the feedback that students are receiving for a number of, of reasons and purposes. So that's, that's, that's the rationale behind the session this morning. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Peter, who's going to um, introduce the session and the speakers that we have today. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Um, I'd just like to introduce the uh, speakers who are going to talk about uh, analysis of feedback. First of all, there's uh, Holly Smith from the Institute of Education. And uh, Holly is part of uh, uh, one of the assessment of feedback projects called Assessment Careers. There's Anne Jones from Queen's University, Belfast, who's part of the E-Effect uh, project. Uh, in Ireland, and there's Maria Fernandez Toro, who's from the OU, and she is part of the EFET uh, project at the OU. Um, I've just typed into the text chat details of those projects. It has the hot links to the project site, so you can get a little bit uh, more information from them. So the webinar objectives, uh, first of all, I'm just going to give a quick uh, overview of uh, sort of reflecting back on the project, so of the question why analyze feedback? And then each of the projects uh, in turn is going to talk about these three issues, approaches and tools for analyzing feedback, their experiences of using the tools, and the benefits, impact, and challenges uh, from using the tools. So if I go on to the first question, which is why analyze feedback. And this probably, these points, bullet points here, represent the, the common reasons for analyzing feedback. Now, certainly in, in all the projects, when they've done the baselining, and one of the advantages of a JISC uh, project is that one can actually do some significant research into baselining the types of feedback. Um, they found that there is fairly wide, wide inconsistent practice in both the quality and quantity of feedback. And that alone should be a cause for concern and uh, a stimulus to exploring uh, feedback in more detail. Um, the second thing I think that has come out of a lot of projects is that there's often a lack of learner understanding of the value and importance of feedback, and, and for that reason that they tend not to, learners tend not to engage with and dialogue and action uh, on feedback. And again, that's uh, a pretty important thing because that then leads to the next point, which if, if teachers put a lot of effort in to uh, uh, feedback, it's rather kind of uh, low on the efficiency scales of, of their time. So this, uh, this point here about not use, utilizing self and peer feedback, again, that's another important reason. And I think one of the other reasons that's come back is that trans transmitted, the sort of one-way type of feedback, does create dependency on the teacher. And there is this sort of point at the bottom here, which is sort of David Boards and David Nichols' uh, key, key points, that we do want to move from this idea of learners being dependent on feedback or feedback that's something done to them to when they graduate, they become independent learners um, capable of self-review. Another point which I've actually found terribly interesting um, is about reduced staff satisfaction uh, when there is uh, no evidence of feed forward. And that's certainly come out of the projects that when um, learners actually act on the feedback and engage with it, it actually does increase staff satisfaction and that becomes a, a big motivator. And the last point is, as you probably all know, that NSS scores often drive the need for looking at feedback. But there is a, a point, and I think we can, might want to discuss that later, that 
um, you might increase the, the quality of, of feedback and the engagement with it, but there is the possibility that it might not affect MMS scores, and there are various reasons for that, that uh, unless you kind of take the students uh, with you and they understand the value of uh, feedback, um, they might not rate it as, as important. And secondly, um, I think some of the projects have found that if some staff increase uh, the, value, uh, the, the, the quality and quantity of feedback, it might reflect on other members of staff who aren't doing it, and it, that can kind of create dissatisfaction. So those are the kind of, I think, a summary of some of the key reasons why uh, feedback should be analyzed. We're now actually going to go on, and each of the projects is going to talk in turn. Um, the three projects about approaches and tools for analyzing feedback. And we're going to start off with Holly from the Institute of Education. Hello. Um, so I'm introducing um, a feedback tool that was developed by my colleague, um, Dr. Gwyneth Hughes at the Institute of Education, who's the, the leader of the Assessment Careers Project. Um, this is just a note on. Um, the feedback analysis tool, obviously it, it, um, it is an analysis tool, um, just to clarify, it's absolutely not uh, intended to analyze the quality of um, feedback, as, as you'll see when we have a look at it, um, although it's a type, typology. Um, so uh, we just just had to, as, as you would with research, um, set up some sort of uh, rules for, for how the analysis would be done so that we could try and um, Quite a consistent way of analysing feedback because we had quite large quantities of it. Okay. Any any questions? Fine. Let's have a look at the the actual tool. So um, Gwyneth Hughes uh, adapted this from um, Osmond and Murray's uh, feedback analysis tool. And there there are there are three main um, categories in in this typology. Um, one praising, these are the P categories, uh, one's critique, um, and one's giving advice. Um, then there's, there's uh, some sort of extra random um, things really, other, um, and clarifications and questions. And I, I think that that's, that's led to one of our biggest problems with the, the tool actually, is because this this is um, an analysis tool which looks at the kinds of um, feedback, the, the the number of instances um, on an assignment, that feedback given um, of praise, of critique, or of advice. Um, but that's totally empirical; it's not theoretically based. So um, the, the questions um, category, I think, raises a sort of slightly um, conceptual issue about it. Which is um, because this isn't theoretically derived; it's empirically um, derived. If if you um, took a more theoretically based approach, um, that, that what you're aiming for is developing um, dialogic feedback, where comments are turned into a question to start a, a dialogue with the student. Um, that that uh, that then leads to a coding um, dilemma. Is that question um, sort of um, do you think, um, and do you have any other examples here? Is is that coded as as a question, a question, or is it is it um, coded as a piece of advice that has been turned around in, into a question? So we don't have any data at all on interrater reliability. But when we did a little um, little experiment, we we did find um, questions um, being recoded as as were frequently being recoded as criticism or, or advice, if that was the content of the question. And so that raised a bit of a dilemma. OK. Any any questions having seen the tool? OK, shall we move on then? Thank you, Holly. And over to Anne. Uh, good, um, good afternoon, everybody. The the EFFECT project, been working with the School of Psychology, one of the things that they wanted to do was to develop some shared and jointly owned standards so that they could lead to bring about some consistency of feedback. 
And so one of the, the actions that we took with them was to um, the project team to analyse a range of um, first and second year work and then to develop that into a, a feedback a workshop for, st for staff around feedback. But they were also interested in terms of what the students say. And so we ran some uh, focus groups with some students in the first and second year. And these are some of the comments that they, they came up with. Uh, what does a question mark and what question mark mean in the margin? Um, clearly, you know, they're not getting the messages, or they're not understanding the messages that are being used. One example we came up against was a cross was a student who didn't understand the word that was used and asked us what it meant. And once we'd explained it, oh yes, I understand now. So it's that kind of thing. So we, we gathered some student um, feedback and then we analysed a sample of work from year one and year two in terms of their essays and the, the lab reports. And we analysed those using a content analysis of the depth of feedback um, and adapted the Glover and Brown categories um, that um, they presented in their 2006 paper. And so we looked for the depth of feedback, level one, level two, level three, was it just a question mark or what in the uh, margin, for example, or was it just a tick or good would be a level one. And then if it was correction was provided, correct spelling, for example, or why it was a strength, then level two. And then level three, sort of why it was incorrect, how it could be changed, made better, and how a strength could be, could be built upon. So what we did was we took student um, work and for each of their pieces of work the students have a cover sheet and the cover sheet has the um, criteria and the standard achieved and then sometimes it will have a comment underneath it. That cover sheet is attached to the student's piece of work which has been marked online and some pieces of work will have had comments added, some will have had track changes and some will have had neither of those. So we took each piece of work and we analysed the cover sheet in terms of the criteria, the general comments at the end, and then the comments, if there were any, on the pieces of work themselves. And the criteria that we used for um, analysis, comments of the content of the student's response, so error, misconception, correct, good, um, clarification, sort, some idea about the analysis, the level of analysis, then comments designed to develop student skills in terms of their communication and referencing, etc. Comments about the student's achievement, praise, negative comments, and then some comments for further learning. The interesting thing with the track changes as opposed to the comments in the thing was that often students it seemed to us it's often unclear as to why the track change had been made and very difficult for students to, to pull through the, the messages that were, were being offered um, through that. Uh, and similarly here we can see that on this one there are quite a few um, comments there and sometimes the, the, the paper was, was littered with what might almost be described as confetti and perhaps you know, the questions perhaps to be raised there in terms of you know, how clearly the feedback is, is being given. More may not necessarily be, be better. And I'll leave it there for now. Hello, uh, I'm Maria from the eFeedback uh, Evaluation Project at the Open University. Um, the system we, anal we use for analysing feedback uh, was also based on Brown and Glover, um, although rather than talking about uh, levels of feedback, we prefer to talk about different layer, layers of scaffolding because sometimes you know, different uh, layers may be present at the same time. Um, what, we, what we looked at was whether the feedback focused on strengths or weaknesses and also how much information the feedback provided, so, so also in terms of uh, call it depth or call it layers of scaffolding. And we developed uh, um, an, an analysis tool 
uh, which we call the feedback analysis chart for tutors, the FACT tool. Uh, the idea was to provide a visual profile of what a, what a tutor did in the feedback. So here are two examples unlabeled, but basically, you know, red is feedback on weaknesses, blue is feedback on strengths, and it gives you an idea of how, at, at a glance, you can see how, how thick the feedback is, how much information is provided. So um, this is a more detailed table uh, showing uh, the, the levels. And the first level is uh, Brown and Glover's level one. An error is identified, or a strength is identified. Um, the second level we added, which is uh, categorization, because in languages, which is our discipline, uh, many this occurs quite often. The, the tutor will say, well, it's an error of agreement, but leave the student to figure out what the correction would be. And we felt it was necessary to, to, to give it more fine grain to, to, the, to the categories and add this uh, categorization level. Uh, then le our level three, which is the same as uh, level two in Brown and Glover, uh, errors corrected, or indeed for, for strengths, strengths illustrated with specific examples from the student's performance. Um, level four, which is an, an, expla when ex an explanation is given, so that would be uh, Brown and Glover's uh, level three. Um, both for weaknesses and for strengths. And uh, we added another layer of scaffolding, which is not necessarily, necessarily a different depth, but it is another layer of scaffolding where advice is given on how to prevent errors or how to develop existing strengths in future. So the, the possible uses of this uh, are that uh, you can compare uh, the feedback relating to different criteria by coding different all the feedback related to a certain criterion and then coding all the feedback related to another. You can compare the feedback given by different tutors or compare the feedback given by um, given to more proficient students or less proficient students. Uh, feedback related to different types of assignments, in our case, for example, spoken presentations or written essays. And uh, what we focused on in, in the project, which was feedback delivered through different media, so written feedback versus audio recorded feedback. Here's an example of what it, uh, what it, what a profile might look like for a beginner, and it shows very clearly that at a glance, you can see, um, you can see uh, what um, what people, what what uh, what tutors are are doing. Uh, you see, for example, what is striking is that we we have coded con comments on content separately from comments on language in the assignments, and you can see that on the script itself there is absolutely no feedback on the content. Well, because it's a beginner assignment, this is understandable because probably the content was just uh, talk about uh, your daily routine. If the student covers all points, that is addressed here, probably something like you have covered all the points in the general feedback form. In the, uh, uh, and then there is no need to put anything on the script. Uh, what is striking is that on the script you got a, an awful lot more feedback on weaknesses and the feedback is at many more different levels, whereas on strengths it stays at level one, just indicated you, you've done well and that's all the student knows about the strengths. Um, so that's, that's one example. Another example very quickly. Uh, of a more advanced student, and you see that there is more feedback. There is more feedback on both strengths and weaknesses in in all the media except on the script, where the feedback on content uh, focuses only on the on the errors, and there's no feedback on the strengths. Uh, but there is a lot of feedback on the strengths on the on the general feedback form. So all in all, you know the 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 different aspects of feedback are covered. That's just to show how it, it gives you at a glance impression, impression of uh, what the feedback is doing in a particular case. Any questions?
Okay, well, I think we've got plenty of time, uh, Bray, at the end for uh, questions. So if there aren't any at the moment, and uh, uh, as perhaps the speakers uh, uh, showing their slides, do, do, do type into the text chat if you have any issues or questions to raise. So let's move on now. And again, I'm going to ask each of the projects, starting with Holly, to talk about their institutional experience of using the tools. Hello. So um, the experience at the uh, Institute of Education. So um, we, we used the tool um, last year to uh, look at hundreds and hundreds. Um, I've separated them into summative and formative uh, uh, feedback. So this 228 is just, I think, the, um, that might just be the summative. Um, and then we also used it again um, we're just completing that process now to look at the same courses and the same um, five programmes um, to do another um, profile um, feedback analysis tool. And we, we, did, we did find quite a lot of variety both in the, the, uh, the amount of feedback given and in the types of feedback given according to our typology. So let's, let's just give you a look at those results. So these are just the results for the summative assessments um, because the formative assessments do have a very different um, profile and they, they are overwhelmingly advice for um, for editing and redrafting it. So so there's there's much, much, much more um, A, one, two and three. So we thought it's um, more interesting to look at the summative assessment because the goals of the assessment to create a project are to try and move towards longitudinal feedback, by which we mean feedback um, that's beyond the modular level and, and, and at the program level, that goes feed forward, that goes beyond the current um, assessment and the current module and, and looks to future ones. So um, you can see uh, the largest category is praise. Um, so perhaps following um, traditional strictures about, about giving feedback that you should tell students what they've done well. Um, critique, the second largest uh, ca category um, there. Um, a little bit of advice for future assignments. Um, but if, if, um, if you recall from the feedback tool we showed earlier, one of those categories uh, was um, about feed feed forward to future assignments and that, that was tiny, that's almost negligible. So um, this is last year's data from the baseline analysis just of the summative um, assessment feedback and uh, it was mostly praise so that was our, that was our finding. Okay, um, Holly, thanks for that. There, there are several kind of linked questions there in the text chat about, first of all, where, where the, were the tutors aware of how their feedback would be analysed, and uh, also about uh, if there was any resistance from them. Perhaps you could just make a comment on those. Sure. Let me go through these um, in in, uh, in order they came, um, came in. So, sorry, Jill asked, was there resistance to tutors? Um, well. Uh, we, we asked informed consent uh, from, from people to do, do this. So the, the, the project structure is that there's five, five pilot leaders uh, running it. Now, I think in two cases, the pilot leader is the sole tutor, and so all the feedback is from them. But in other cases, um, say in, in um, a PTCE course, there's 10 tutors, it's huge, or uh, the program I'm connected with, there's eight tutors. So we asked all the tutors to contribute um, that the, their, their their assignments with feedback to be analysed, and um, some tutors did not participate. So I'm not sure I would call that resistance. I, I they may have they may not have contributed them for a variety of reasons, not least amongst which is they had to dig out the stuff and email it to um, the the researcher who's analysing it, because at the minute we don't have. Um, an, online submission as a standard at the Institute of Education. But one reason might have been um, resistance. So the five pilot programmes, all volunteers all participated, but the extent to which colleagues also participated varies. 
Uh, second question here, were the tutors aware of how their feedback would be analysed before they gave the students feedback? No, they, they agreed to share their feedback and have it analysed. Um, and then on the five programmes, um, this is this is the collective um, analysis, but an anal analysis for each of the five pro pilot programmes was also created. And um, Gwyneth Hughes then went back to each of the five programmes and had a programme team meeting where their, their collective results were fed back. So that was the first time they saw the, the tool. And um, it, it was quite surprised and quite interested um, to, to see this, this profile. Um, obviously, this year, the, the, that, was, that was the last year for the baseline. This year, when the results are being analysed, they, they've been through the process of getting their feedback profile, and that very often triggered a discussion uh, uh, about it, so they are aware. Um, so Jill's asked about an ideal feedback profile. Um, we absolutely don't have an ideal pro feedback profile, and in fact, that's a, quite a serious concern I have about this, is that it could be used in an extremely unfortunate reductionist way. So you could look at it and say, well, actually, we're giving far too much praise, so we want to cut praise to be 20% of the feedback we give, and we want to up um, advice to be 40%. And that, that's not what, how we envisaged it. At these program team meetings where they received their profiles, there was quite an open-ended discussion about what sort of profile they might like. Um, but for many teams, this this was the first this was the first time that they they had actually discussed feedback as a program team. So um, program teams often have um, you know annual review meetings or even away days and, and talk about things. But feedbacks feedbacks generally generally not it. Um, Maria, you've got your hand up. Can I just uh, hand over to you for? A Yes, uh, I just wanted to to add that uh, we we came to the same conclusion. You know, we 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 found it. Uh, we would find it very difficult to, to talk about uh, what ideal feedback would be, because it so depends of um, how the feedback is used and how the student is expected to use the feedback and and. You know, it is very individual. Uh, also, we, we don't really know enough. We're just analyzing feedback at the moment. Uh, it is very, val very valuable for raising awareness on what feedback can do. Uh, but at this stage, uh, certainly in, in our case, we would be very cautious about um, making um, specific recommendations uh, one way or another. Absolutely, I think that's exactly where we're at. We found it was very useful in raising awareness, but but we absolutely wouldn't want to be prescriptive um, about that. Um, so just trying to pick up further questions there. Um, um, yes, the 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 feedback was anonymous. However, if you if on, on a certain module, there's one person who's the pilot leader, and they're the only person who gave it. Obviously, it's not very anonymous. Where you know six people in the team had contributed, and then the program team of eight met. No, no one knew who had contributed and who had not, and it was um, aggregated. So it was it was collective uh, for that program team, separated out from the other five pilots. So practically, that's how how we did it. Um, were there any other uh, questions? Holly, there was, there was a question there from Pete uh, B about uh, uh, experiences at the IOE. Do you see it at 1228? Um, Pete B, um, formative and summative feedback, yes. We did, yes, we did find a, a huge difference. Um, yes, I'm sure it was because of purpose, uh, because uh, because the formative was so weighted towards advice for, for um, the current assignment, so it was you know when when you rewrite this, you should do do this that, that or, or the other. Um, I take your point that formative feedback isn't seen by the external examiner, whereas summative might be. Um, I, I think the process of having their feedback analysed and seeing the um, analysis profile for the programme back did raise, um, make tutors more, more aware at the IOE. Um, so Brian Wiley's made a praise is a comment, it's not really feedback. Well, ag again, I, th I think um, I think that's, that's a slightly contentious view. Um, 
praise, if you say that's lovely, um, it's a comment, but if you say I really like the way you um, compared and contrasted these two things, I absolutely do think that's feedback um, and, and pretty useful feedback. So we've, we've actually had some arguments within our, our um, team. Um, <laughs> Gwen thinks there's too much praise, maybe we should be cutting down on praise, but if, if the praise is, is, is quite explicitly about the way somebody's done certain, certain things, then um, uh, I, I think that can, that can be very useful and in fact that should feed forward because if, 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 if someone's praised for the way they've done a certain thing then, then they're more likely to do a scan another time. Okay, um, thanks Holly. But there was actually one question also Peter V made about um, the efficiency of this or time taken for the different types of feedback and of course this always is um, an issue, uh, isn't it? And I certainly think that some of the GIST projects are looking into this type of efficiency. And I know at uh, Dundee um, uh, and some other institutions, they're actually looking at um, the whole sort of holistic approach to assessment of feedback and saying, do we need to um, have so many summative assessments? In fact, that can actually detract from the overall sort of learning and actually have a sort of uh, an appropriate level of summative and focus more on the kind of affordative sides. Um, but maybe we'll um, pick up that issue of efficiency a little bit later. I, I'd like to move on now. Um, okay, that is, a big, that is a big issue. <laughs> time is, is crucial. Yeah, time and, and um, for very British staff is crucial. But yes, let's come back to that later. Mm -hmm. and, and there was also, I think, the issue why I mentioned earlier about staff satisfaction because. Um, uh, uh, but when staff do see, and this is sort of the feedback I've got from the projects, that when staff do see uh, that their students are actually acting on their uh, feedback and responding to and getting value out of it, there is an increased staff satisfaction which could offset any issues or, so, or, or some issues to a degree about increased time. So Anne, shall I pass over to you? Thank you, Peter. Um, here I'm just going to present some of the results from the analysis that we did on the, the essays. The previous discussion has been very interesting in the fact that we just took a sample of work. Um, the only condition was that it had to be across all the different um, grade bands um, for each of the, the modules. And the, the, the staff knew that we were, we were doing this, but it was work from um, largely from the previous year. Um, so we're just going to talk about the, the comments here. Um, so just summarising the, um, the overall comments, year one and year two, um, weaknesses um, are more often mentioned in year one and indeed in year two, um, but in terms of the student response and the student skills, but in terms of the strengths, it's very slightly more in terms of the achievement as opposed to the strength on achievement rather than the weaknesses on, on achievement. And in a sense, that goes back to what Holly said about um, giving praise um, where, 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 where possible. So a very similar pattern from year one to year two. Oops, there we go. Um, in terms of the, the further learning, and this was a very small percentage of comments were actually given over to, to further learning. Um, for the first year, slightly more on the source materials, but not much different, um, and certainly for the first years in terms of future work. But it was the, with the second year students that they were beginning to sort of try and get some dialogue going and reflection, asking them to, to think a bit more about what they were, they were doing. As I say, very much a sort of um, very, very tiny proportion of the comments were in, in that area. And then Looking at the, the depth of um, comments that um, we, we found, and this comes perhaps to back to Jill's question about an ideal profile, and I'm not sure that we would have an ideal profile, certainly not, not as yet. Um, and here I've summarised the year one and the year two, and it's a very different um, pattern really, the very sort of pyramidal pattern in terms of, of year two, very much more strengthening on the weaknesses than on the strengths, but very much fewer 
a smaller proportion of comments at the, the depth of three. Whereas at level two, at level one, year one rather, we've got um, many more level three types of comments than um, we have in, in the second year. And uh, it's just an interesting, sort of almost a, an inverse pattern there um, that uh, we, can, we can see. And if we were to move towards some kind of um, model, maybe, then maybe then that idea, certainly in, the, in year one, whereby we've got this here, um, band here of two, it's been corrected, and they've so it's been identified and it's been corrected, or it's been identified and um, some of the response has been given, as opposed to some explanation. Um, but increasingly, moving away from just the, the sort of the, the bare bones, but towards the twos and the threes. I'm not sure we'd ever get to the extent where it would be a preponderance of threes. That comes back to a comment that was made about the time involved to, to do some of this. And then looking at some sample modules, and these are samples, when we did this with the staff, the, the module names were there so that they knew which module was which. Um, but again, very different patterns. And that um, triangular pattern coming through in the year twos and the more um, constructive feedback, perhaps, in terms of providing explanations as to why something isn't quite, isn't right, or an explanation as to why something is, is, is good, um, and also in this particular module in year one, and um, correction in year one at level two here in, the, in this model. So we did this on the sample of work across the first and the second year modules. They're compulsory for these students. So it allowed us to see the changes from year to year. Um, and then we presented our findings in very much more detail than I've, been, than I've done here today to the, to the staff. Uh, we presented how we, we done the analysis, presented them with a detailed presentation of the, the different categories. Um, and the modules, and then we asked them to work with some samples of work and analyze the feedback that was on them using a condensed version of the pro forma that, that we'd been using, so content, skill, achievement, and further learning, and they were asked to identify whether it was anything was a strength or a weakness and the, the level of the, the feedback. Uh, and so on. And that we found really got them from talking, realizing the issues involved, the inconsistencies. Um, the work that they were given was all anonymized. We redacted all student names and numbers and so on, so they didn't know um, which student it was. Um, but it really got them from talking about it and beginning to pick up on some of the, the ideas and the, the issues. And what they really came out with was this idea of the, the track changes um, as opposed to the, the comments. And one of the things that they're going to move forward to is to say that you shouldn't use track changes, but rather to use the, the comments more. Um, and to they're redesigning their um, feedback sheets so that there's scope for them to indicate a key message for the student is about what they could do next time to um, improve a piece of work. So that feed forward um, aspect to the, um, to the feedback as much as anything, particularly so that students can see how the more generic skills can be moved from one piece of work to another as opposed to necessarily the, the content. Are there any questions? I, I was just wondering, and um, there were some questions earlier that Holly took about um, how tutors react uh, to, to, to this. Perhaps you could sort of mention a little bit about that at Queen's? Uh, the, the tutors were really very positive about it. They, they themselves had asked for this to be done. 
um, this was decided at um, a school away day that they wanted to, to do this. So the, the whole school was present when um, this action was drawn up. And so they, they were interested, they want to do this. They've been using e-submission, e-marking, e-feedback for some time in this school. And what they were finding was that their NSS scores weren't improving, and they were concerned about it. So it was decided that just beginning to look at the feedback that the students were getting was a step that they could take to, um, to, to do this. And on the project, of course, we're not part of the school. Um, uh, we're sort of we're facilitating the, the discussions that they're having. So they were, they were happy with this. Obviously, when we put up the, um, the presentation to them and the module codes were there, they knew which, whose modules were which. But it was about sharing the experience and sharing the discussions. OK, th th thanks for that. I mean, I, to, to me, that sounds incredibly pop, uh, positive, that there, there is such positive feedback from uh, tutors uh, uh, about that because you kind of could imagine that some would be a bit negative about it. Okay, so perhaps we move on to the uh, next slide and over to Maria. Uh, yes, what, what we did uh, to you just to explain uh, how the, the feedback uh, is organized, we've got the feedback summary. And that is that that, uh, that is a form and, and looks uh, criterion by criterion, but also an annotated script. So again, with with markup, and so we we looked at those two media and compared them. And in the in the speaking assignments, we've got the the form which has the, the feedback summary. But uh, because uh, students are learning a foreign language and they need feedback on things like pronunciation and fluency, um, and also, of course, there isn't a script in an oral assignment, what they get is an audio recording, uh, you know, along, you know, where, where the, the feedback is, um, is uh, discussed. Uh, so we looked at 100 writing assignments and 100 speaking assignments. Uh, we looked, uh, they, they included uh, the four levels we teach and uh, a sample of nine tutors per level and for each of the tutors uh, a sample of three students. Um, so in total we had uh, about 200 uh, feedback forms uh, which are the summaries and then about 100 annotated scripts with a word markup and about 100 audio files. And we looked at, just, this is very summarized. Uh, we are still analyzing the data, so more, more information should, uh, should come. Uh, but just in a nutshell, really, we found similar patterns in, I mean, if I, if I look at the previous slide, similar patterns in the feedback summary for the writing and for the speaking. So on the one side, we had one set of patterns for, for those two documents, because in fact, the medium was very similar. And on the, one, on the other hand, the feedback patterns uh, in, in the annotated script and the audio recorded uh, feedback were fairly comparable to each other. So this is a summary of, of the findings. On the feedback forms, they tended to comment more on strengths. Uh, they tended to focus more on content than on language, on the content of the assignment rather than on the, on the use of language. Um, and they tended to categorize uh, strengths and errors. That's not too surprising because when you when you write in a summary, you're saying the type of strength and the type of error that you do. And all these uh, tendencies, all these patterns were more evident in the case of the written assignment than in the case of the uh, speaking assignment. Uh, conversely, on the script and on the audio feedback, there were more comments on weaknesses, uh, presumably because the script is there. The, if you're going to comment on an error, uh, you're more likely to do it when the error can actually be seen uh, using markup. Um, 
there were more comments, specific comments on, on language rather than on the content of the assignment. Uh, more errors that were corrected, and again that's not too surprising because it's easier to do it on a script, but then it also happened on the audio feedback, you know, it was used for correcting errors of pronunciation, etc., specific errors. Uh, whereas, of course, in the feedback form, uh, the feedback uh, had to be necessarily more, more general. Um, and then, interestingly, more explanations uh, on, the, um, on the script annotations and on the audio feedback, and it was particularly high in the audio feedback, so it's something worth looking into that confirms the findings of some of, of uh, previous research on, on audio, uh, well, we've got uh, more, more evidence uh, supporting this. I'm not going to discuss the bottom of the slide because basically is uh, the, the, the mirror image of, of the top of the slide. You know, more of the the, above, the 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 features in green and less of the features in in red. Any questions? Um, I, I suppose I, I, it's, it's a question that I'd like to ask uh, all, all three of you, um, and that is, you, you've had the opportunity uh, within the GIST project to spend some considerable time on analysing feedback. Now, for those projects who you know haven't got that kind of uh, funding uh, or resource to actually do that, in other words, how can you? kind of continue to do this on a sort of everyday basis so it becomes normal practice. Are there any kind of hot tips for that? That's something, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to discuss it uh, later on in the, in the next section of the, of the presentation, but um, basically this is obviously for research. Uh, and it's extremely time consuming, there are big issues of uh, reliability, uh, and I mean, I'll discuss that uh, a little bit later. But um, I think uh, to raise awareness, uh, you don't need to go into such level of detail, and you don't need to do it every single time. All you need is one workshop to, to show the tutors what it's all about, and then you develop a mindset of, of awareness, and, and I think that, that uh, is enough, I think, to, to, to make tutors realize what it is they're doing, and maybe now and then a reminder, we developed um, uh, a worksheet, uh, you know, the, uh, one size of A4, to, to think about all this, so, so that, that would be my answer, you know, I wouldn't implement this systematically uh, every time, but uh, if it does the job, uh, you know, that's, that's fine, we, we're doing the job for them in a way, and, and I think um, you can choose in how much uh, depth you want to, to, to go in, in, the, in the training and in cascading it within the institution. Thanks for that. Anne and Holly, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I agree with, with Maria there. I mean, it's, in a sense, this was one activity that we've done within a whole host of different activities, and so um, it, 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 it hasn't taken up all of the time of this, this just project. Um, but in terms of getting the discussion going, then I can see that the materials that we've developed could be used in, in workshops with groups of staff to present the view and then to get them to analyze some of their own feedback using the, the tool. It's getting that discussion going among them that is, that's important, it's raising the awareness. And as Maria said, that's one of the things that I've got on the last slide. Um, yes, yes I, uh, I, I can only um, agree it would be absolutely out of the question um, without special one-off funding to get large samples of feedback and analyze them on a sentence or partial at a sentence level. Um, I think that's out of the question. Um, as a as a developmental activity, you could if you had a program team that had a couple of hours and were willing to do so, you you, you could meet with the program team, introduce uh, any one one of these tools and or maybe ask members of the program team to analyze 
a single script and um, set of feedback according to it as a way to sort of raise awareness uh, and discuss what sort of feedback the team yeah. gives them and what they want to give. Yeah, I, I, I think, that, uh, and I think uh, a sort of um, DWS from UWL says, you know, how can one actually kind of um, make this into a sort of day-to-day -day normal practice operationalization in 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 uh, in a fairly kind of efficient way? Um, I mean, it's perhaps, and I, I think uh, Maria has just mentioned the uh, Ometra project um, has developed an electronic tool. Um, which automatically kind of analyzes feedback and feed that, feeds that back to the tutors. And I think that's quite an interesting thing, uh, a project to pursue. And in fact, it would have been quite nice if um, perhaps uh, uh, someone was here from that project. Um, but we'll, we'll uh, as DW says, we'll try and get some links to that project in a minute. Oh, yeah, Marianne's already kind of done that. Let's move on to the, I'm just aware of time, to the last section, which is benefits, impact, and challenges from using the tools. So, uh, Holly, can I ask you to address that first? Holly, uh, can you turn your mic on? Sorry, but, um, yes, very, very briefly. Um, the biggest benefit of using the tool with program teams has, has been it's enabled discussion of feedback at program team level, um, sometimes for the, for the first time, um, and it, it enables reflection about the, the types of feedback we're currently giving and would like to give at a, a program um, team level. It's a little bit early to talk about it, impact, but um, we have found though there, there is a substantial challenge that Feedback practices are very well established. Um, I, we think they are quite resistant to change. Actually, I think people um, people have been doing their practice. I don't know. I have for for decades, and they have had formative experiences um, earlier in their careers about how how to to give feedback. And then um, it's not it, it's it's not an easy, straightforward thing to to change. That's all I wanted to say there. Thanks. Uh, over to you, Em. Um, really very similar to, to Holly in that um, the benefits have been that staff can see the real issue, that it's not an imagined one, but it is real, and this engendering of dialogue, getting them to talk to each other about feedback and so on, and raising the, this idea of the awareness of feedback messages. Um, are they actually getting the message through to the, to the students? Um, the, the, the idea of maybe sometimes there's too much written on the text on the, on the pieces of work and that students can't see the wood for the trees in many respects. Equally, ours is a work in progress. We, it's, we've, we've started this process and uh, we need to see how we move it forward in the future and how this, in this particular case the school in, in question processes it forward in the future. The challenge is in reaching consensus on the, the level and the quantity of feedback, how much feedback should be given, what level of feedback. I mean, the whole question comes down to the, you know, whether or not the, the feedback is of use to students and how the students going to use it. So that's another step along the, the journey in many respects. Okay, thank you. And uh, over to Maria. Marie, you need to turn on your microphone. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I was talking away to myself. Uh, yes, we, we've dis as I said earlier, um, there's two different things. It's a research tool, uh, and then it's a training and awareness raising tool, and they're two very different things. As a research, research tool, we find it very useful to identify uh, the, the overall patterns of, of use of the different media. Uh, on, on our language assignments. Uh, we also found that it was uh, extremely 
reliable in terms of we did do inter-rater reliability tests, but we have to, I have to say we have to have four rounds of fine-tuning it, and the criteria became more and more complicated with each round in order to be reliable. So it's absolutely not practical uh, in in any other way than a research tool. Uh, so it doesn't work basically for quantifying and making uh, reliable quantifications. I think we all agree on that. Um, so uh, the, the results uh, need to be interpreted with caution, uh, and it comes back to what we were saying earlier about um, an ideal uh, form of feedback. Deeper feedback is not necessarily the most appropriate to all students because we may well want them to operate within their, their, their zone of proximal development, you know, so, so you're actually uh, not giving all the information you want them to bridge the gap themselves, but obviously uh, how do we know we, we're getting it right? Um, so uh, we, we wouldn't recommend a particular depth uh, in, in, in all cases. Um, it's, uh, as I was saying earlier, it's not suitable for quantitative ev evaluation by practitioners because of the, the complex guidelines we had to, to develop to make it reliable. Uh, but it is suitable, uh, and again, it's something that seems to be coming uh, to, to be consensual ac across all the projects discussed here. It's suitable for awareness raising purposes in, in staff training, and it's also interesting to see that we had very similar uh, uh, approaches to training. You know, we uh, we too got tutors to to do their own coding on on their feedback given by their, themselves, and also a sample of anonymous uh, uh, assignments. Um, so we've produced uh, a sample of marked assignments, uh, anonymized. We've produced coding grids. But the other thing that we have done, and maybe we should have discussed it here, the thing is it's not uh, an analysis tool as such, but we have uh, asked the students to produce webcasts where they give their feedback on the feedback. And that enables us to look at different depths and look at how students uh, perceive those depths and what additional work the students do and how far, how much further the students can take that feedback by themselves. For example, if an error has been categorized and you've just been told this is an agreement error, is the student then able to want to correct it and explain the correction or not? And that's the direction in which our, our future work is developing. Uh, it's all on, our, on, on the project blog. Um, so, to sum up, the fact criteria are now also presented as a simplified checklist that, to, to help reflection, and uh, um, this is informing new research, a new research strand where we'll be looking not just at analyzing the tutor's feedback, but really analyzing how the students uh, relate to uh, engage with that feedback, but the, the, the analysis tools uh, can be used to do this. That's, that's all I had to say really on the, on the FACT project. Hello everyone, I'm not sure that Peter's able to hear us at the moment, so I'll just pick up, and, and thanks Maria for that um, explanation there. Um, do we have any other questions? Um, we're following the text chat at the moment, but if there's anything we've missed, please do put your hand up and um, ask a question either via audio or, or the text chat. Okay, well maybe in that case, given that it's um, one o'clock, we'll draw the session to a close, but thanks again for, um, to all the presenters for an excellent session. Please do follow up on links too to the University of Dundee Interact project and the University of Southampton's UMTENTRA project. They were unable to join us today, um, but they've got a, a, you know, other approaches and other lessons learned around those approaches, so, so please do follow up on the, on the links. So we have some slides there just on any further information and thanks again to, to, to everyone who's attended.